In the previous chapter, we grouped the cortex into four cortical lobes, the frontal lobes, the parietal lobes, the temporal lobes, and the occipital lobes. Specifically, we discussed in depth the frontal lobes and differentiated between three areas there, the primary motor, the motor association areas, and the prefrontal cortex. In this chapter, we will discuss the remaining three cortical lobes, the parietal, the temporal, and the occipital. Collectively, these lobes are referred to as the sensory lobes because unlike the frontal lobes, which deal primarily with motor execution, the remaining lobes all take in sensory information and use that to create a meaningful perceptual experience of your world. Let's begin by discussing the parietal lobes. The parietal lobes play an important role in processing somatic information. That is, taking signals from your skin, the parietal lobe creates the sensations of things like touch, pressure, pain, and temperature. In addition, the parietal lobes are a key area for multisensory integration and play an essential role in things like spatial navigation. As with other lobes, we make a distinction here between the primary sensory area and the association areas for the parietal lobes. The primary sensory area for the parietal lobes is called the somatosensory cortex, and it's located posterior and runs parallel to the central sulcus. Now, just as the primary motor cortex of the frontal lobes contains what we call the motor homunculus, that is a direct mapping of all the muscles that it controls in your body, the somatosensory cortex of the parietal lobes has a direct mapping of all the somatic senses it receives. Now, this representation is somewhat distorted in that the size of a given area of that somatosensory cortex corresponds to the sensitivity of the body area, not its size. Just behind the somatosensory cortex lies the posterior parietal area, which is the association area for the parietal cortex. Now, the posterior parietal area actually consists of several subdivisions, but here we'll talk about it as one functional unit. Perhaps the most important thing to know about the posterior parietal area is that it is the location of massive multisensory integration. Because it integrates somatic sense with visual and auditory information, the posterior parietal area plays an important role in tracking and guiding movement in space. The second sensory lobe that we'll talk about today is the temporal lobe. The temporal lobe plays an important role in the processing of auditory information. Everything from decoding very basic sound qualities like volume and frequency, all the way up to complex language comprehension. As we have in discussing other lobes, we'll make a distinction here between the primary auditory cortex and its association areas. The primary auditory cortex of the temporal lobes is the major target area for auditory signals from the cochlea of the inner ear. Now, just like the other sensory lobes, this primary auditory cortex contains a direct mapping of the sensory information that it processes. In this case, we call it a tonotopic map in that it represents a frequency map that corresponds directly to the information on the cochlea. The major function of the primary auditory cortex is to decode very basic auditory information, such as volume and frequency. Surrounding the primary auditory cortex is what we call the auditory association area. Now, in reality, this association area can be broken down into several different subdivisions, but here we'll talk about it as one functional unit. In general, these areas deal with more complex processing of auditory signals, so everything from understanding the temporal order of sound, which is very important for dealing with things like speech, all the way up to making meaning out of language. The final sensory lobes that we'll talk about today are the occipital lobes, which are involved in the processing of visual information. That is everything from very basic decoding of visual signals for shape and lines and color, all the way up to integrating those signals with your memories in order to identify objects in space.
as with other lobes, we'll make a distinction between the primary visual cortex and its association areas. Let's start with the primary visual cortex. The primary visual cortex of the occipital lobes is the target area for visual signals sent by the retina of the eye. It's often referred to as the striate cortex in both journal articles and some textbooks, but this is just because when you look at it, it has a very distinct striped look to it. As with the primary areas in other sensory lobes, the primary visual cortex contains a direct mapping of the sensory information that it processes. In this case, we call it a retinotopic map because it corresponds directly to the signals on the retina of the eye. However, this retinotopic map is a little distorted in that 50% of it is dedicated to processing information sent by the innermost 10% of the retina. Overall, the primary visual cortex is limited to processing very basic aspects of the visual signal, things like line orientation and angle. It really doesn't deal with more complex things like shapes, color, or texture. Surrounding the primary visual cortex are several visual association areas, which function to take the basic signals from the primary visual cortex and turn it into more complex, meaningful information. In this process, the brain separates the visual signal into two distinct streams of information. There's a ventral stream, what we call the what pathway, that sends a signal from the occipital lobe to the temporal lobe, where the information is analyzed according to things like shape and color, and where memories are used to be able to identify an object. A second stream that comes from the occipital lobe is the dorsal stream, which extends up to the parietal lobe, where the information is analyzed according to size, and movement and location of an object. This so-called where pathway allows us to understand not what the object is, but where it is in space. Let's use an example of how these two streams function together in everyday life. Imagine you're sitting at your kitchen table and you've got a coffee mug in front of you. If you had damage to your ventral stream, that is the stream coming from the occipital lobe to the temporal lobe, you could reach out and grab your coffee mug no problem, but you would not be able to name it or tell me what color it is. In contrast, if you damage that dorsal stream, the wear pathway that comes from the occipital lobe to the parietal lobe, you could tell me all about your coffee mug. You could say it's blue, you could say it's half full with coffee, you could tell me all sorts of things about it, but you would not be able to accurately reach out and grab it on a first try. The distinction between the ventral stream and dorsal stream of the visual system is important because it reveals something fundamental about the way that cortical lobes operate. Too often, just like with brain structures, we'll say the occipital lobe processes visual information. This is true, but once again, it's necessary but not sufficient for the kind of complex processing we need to survive in everyday life. In reality, even for the most basic perceptions, the visual system requires not only an occipital lobe, but also a functioning parietal and temporal lobe. In short, lobes simply don't operate in isolation, even for basic perception. Okay, to summarize. In this chapter, we discussed the three sensory lobes of the cortex, the parietal lobes, which deal primarily with somatic information from the skin, the temporal lobes, which process auditory information from the cochlea of the inner ear, and the occipital lobes, which deal with visual signals sent by the retina of the eye. In each case, we made a distinction between primary sensory areas for a given lobe and their corresponding association areas, which served, among other things, to integrate senses across different modalities. In discussing the association areas and their multi-sensory nature, it became clear that for something as basic as visual perception, the occipital lobe, for example, may be necessary but not sufficient. In many ways, the discussion of cortical lobes, and in particular their association areas, is a microcosm for thinking about the brain as a whole. In reality, the brain is a dynamic system where each part exists in broader neural networks. And it's those neural networks that give rise to things like perception, action, emotion, and memory. To ignore the dynamics of brain organization 
is to misunderstand fundamentally how the brain operates.